Okay, great. Thank you for, for coming. So for Xiang's de uh, defense, uh, PhD defense, defense. So Xiang did some amazing work on uh, caching networks and uh, uh, multi-user cache aided uh, private information retrieval, and also the 6G wireless communications. <coughs> okay, and he has a number of uh, publications. I think maybe I, can, I cannot <coughs> count the number. Probably for more than one, more than ten <laughs> conferences, paper, and also <coughs> like six or seven journal papers. So, yeah. So he's doing. He was doing really extremely great. Okay. So let's get started. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this time is very early, and uh, it's not easy <laughs> for some students here. Uh, so um, this uh, title for my defense is called uh, Fundamental Limits of Cache-Aided Networks, uh, Finite Length Analysis, Multi-User Privacy, and uh, Distributed Power Control for Millimeter Wave Networks. Okay, so basically this consists of kind of two different parts. Um, I'll introduce these two parts separately. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all my committee members, um, uh, uh, especially my supervisor, Doc G, uh, who has been uh, supporting me through my uh, PhD. And I'd also, uh, I would also like to thank all my uh, collaborators from different universities and the students um, also, th there are some information about, uh, uh, about the projects that has supported my research. Okay, now we'll just go through this. Um, so let's first have an overview of the dissertation. So this, in this first part, uh, we studied the fundamental limits of cache aided networks, which basically means the application of coded caching uh, in various different networks. So uh, we actually studied two different aspects of coded caching. So the first one is called finite length analysis or sub packetization complexity. So in coded caching, in order to achieve the algorithm, so a file has to be divided into smaller pieces. This is called a sub packetization. Okay, so the problem with this is that, okay, if you have too many pieces, so the, the signaling overhead will be very large that will hinder the application of coded caching. So, uh, in this case, we first consider a inference, wireless inference network. So the basic setup is that we have multiple servers or transmitters and multiple receivers. So both of them are equipped with some cache. So in this case, we aim to design the how to place this cache and then try to optimize the communication, um, commun communication load uh, through the network. So uh, in this case, we uh, designed a hypercube based a delivery uh, placement and delivery scheme where we represent each file uh, as a Haber cube and uh, the subfiles is just represented by the lattice points in the Haber cube and the user cache the subfiles according to different Haber plans. Also you can think of users are represented by the Haber plans. And uh, then we studied the, uh, studied the finite length analysis in another network setup which is device to device coded caching. So this is a variant of the code cache shared link code caching problem. But the difference is that there's no central server and there are multiple users. So the users take turns to transmit to each other uh, in order to satisfy their demands. We developed a packet type based uh, framework. So in this framework, for example here, we, uh, these numbers are just represent the D2D users. These co different colors just represent the different packet types. This is a novelty where we explore the asymmetry in the placement and the file splitting. And we can achieve a, a smaller number of subfiles per file uh, when compared to the state of the art um, uh, schemes. And then another aspect we study is the privacy. In the original code caching, there's no um, privacy, which means that the server can know the user's demands or other users can know uh, one user's demands. But privacy becomes more and more important nowadays like in distributed machine learning retrieval systems. So we also study the, the privacy aspect of coded caching. So in this case, we formulated a new problem called cache-aided multi-user private information retrieval. So the setup here is that we have multiple servers. We have multiple users, so the users have some cache. So uh, our goal is to design the cache such that, um, so 
when the user wants to ref, uh, request some files, it will send query to the servers and server respond with answers. With these answers, the users can um, um, recover their desired files. The privacy here means that each individual, uh, individual server should not learn the demands of the users. So this problem we have, uh, our goal is to study the fundamental memory load uh, trade-off uh, for such a system. Um, because the time is limited, I only have time to uh, talk about this last part. Um, then for the second part, we studied di study distributed power control for millimeter wave networks. So uh, for this one, we formulated the pro uh, proposed Lyapunov optimization framework in order to optimize the network utility. And then we, uh, by utilizing the drift plus penalty uh, theory, we decompose the problem into two sub-problems. So one of which is convex and easy to solve, but the other is non-convex. So focusing on this, we proposed uh, uh, several different approaches to solve the non-convex sub-problem. So the first one is kind of the, uh, this is the earliest work on this topic. It's, it's a game theoretic approach where we uh, model different base stations uh, as players, and then we use the Nash equilibrium as the solution to that sub-problem. And then, we kind of use reinforcement learning, uh, which is a basic version called Q-learning. Um, in this case, we model the base stations as a learning agent. And then the advantage of this reinforcement learning is that it benefits from active exploration of the action space and different choices. So, and then this for the most recent work, we have applied uh, deep reinforcement learning. So, by using you know, this deep neural nets to represent the policy and the uh, Q functions, it really kind of, it can, this approach can learn very complex and large systems. So uh, specifically, we applied uh, 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 an algorithm called multi-agent deep deterministic policy gradient. Uh, we modified this a little bit to fit our problem. But again, uh, I will today I will only talk about this uh, last part. Okay, so here's a presentation outline like these two different parts. First, I will introduce some motivation about these several aspects of code caching. Then I will kind of dive deeper into cache-aided multi-user private information retrieval. Then I will go to the second part and present our approach there. So uh, for the first part. So uh, let's first get a sense of how code caching works. Okay. So the basic setup here for this system is that we have a server. So the server stores n files denoted by W1 until Wn. Here, uh, we also have k users. Uh, when you see here, the users are equipped with cache memories. This can be used to store some files. So basically, this system works in two different phases. The first phase is called cache placement phase. So in this case, um, the users just fill their fill up their cache memory using the files from the library. So you can think of this as uh, off-peak hours where you know, the communication over this shared link, uh, uh, this link is not, uh, uh, is the cost is, communication cost is negligible. So you, the users can place their uh, cache. And then um, follows, this, follow, is, this is followed by the delivery phase so in this phase, the users will just review their requests of different files. Basically, each user wants to download a file from the server. So the server just sends some coded message to the users so, so that they can recover their desired files. So for this problem, our goal here is, kind of, is to minimize the communication load, which is defined D over L. D here is the total number of downloaded bits from this um, broadcast link. And L here is the file size. Um, so the most fundamental results of code caching is that uh, here, the, this load is achievable. So it, um, this, uh, let's look at this uh, parameter T here is defined as, uh, so M here is the cache memory size of each user. So K here is the number of users. So basically this T means the total uh, cache size of the network. So if we look at this R here, when you look at the numerator, so K here is the number of users, so there's a factor that, that is less than one, which is one minus a single user's cache size over the file, file, uh, uh, number of files. So this part is called the local caching gain. 
So this is traditional what people do in caching systems. So you can see we call this the uh, additive caching game because in this part, if you increase the uh, user cache size, so this load will just jump linearly with, uh, with M. But the most important thing is that in code caching, they identify a game called global caching game, or which is, called, which is this parameter t plus one in the denominator here. So as you can see, this is called the multiplicative game, which means that if you look at t here, if you increase the m here, so basically the load will decrease like the function one over x. So this is called, that decrease, uh, the load decrease much faster than the linear speed. So we call this a multiplicative um, caching game. So for code caching, there could be a lot of applications. Uh, the probably the most uh, prominent one is uh, in video streaming or movie download or something. W usually these files, like a movie, is very chunky. You have to save the communication uh, cost there. Uh, a very specific scenario is that the in-flight in multimedia service over Wi-Fi. Uh, just think about when you take flights, you can watch movies uh, on the back seats, right? But the problem is that nowadays, a lot of these media are transmitted over cables. But the problems that might be when you have to install the cables, you have to kind of um, work, work with the flaws something. But what we can do is that we can, in airplane, we can use Wi-Fi to implement this coded caching scheme to save bandwidth and let, because in, on an air flight, usually there are a lot of people watching movies at the same time. We can, then we can benefit from the coded caching to, to save the uh, communication. Uh, yep. So it, for this particular example, the in-flight um, um, video streaming or multimedia service over Wi-Fi, well, what was the physical meaning of the caching game, the additive and multiplicative? So, um, the physical meaning is just that, so basically this load here is kind of just the, the number of, you know, this traffic that goes through the air, right? And you have a limited bandwidth for Wi-Fi. Yeah. So basically if you do not have, let's see, we, we do the in the traditional way. So only the numerator, this part, this part of the load is achievable. So the problem is that when you have a limited bandwidth, the, when you are watching very high definition videos, it may not be able to serve that. Uh, so the problems here, when you apply coded caching, you see here, if the users, you know, if the each uh, kind of the uh, user or each screen can, um, it, it can store some, a lot of, you know, the, the total cache size of the airplane is very large, then you can reduce the number of kind of data transmitted through the air by this factor. So that will kind of, you know, boost the, the transmission rate, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the multiplicity basically, uh, it's like means that T is a, it's on the denominator, right? Yeah. So it's a multiplied there or divided uh -huh. there. But additive gain is like on the numer numer numerator, right? Uh, okay. One minus, right? It's okay. adding there. Okay. So just <laughs> I see, I see, yeah. In the other words, so if the, the multiplicity gain doubled, then the traffic load passed, okay. or the throughput And the redoubled. better the scenario is. Yeah. Okay, I see, thank you. Very important. So uh, please remember this parameter T here, so this will be used throughout the presentation. Um, yeah, let's look at uh, one simple example of code caching. Uh, so with two users, let's first look at how this local caching game uh, is achieved. So the conventional way of doing this is that Let's assume we have two files, so each file is divided into two parts. So the conventional way of doing this is that we let each user just store the first part of each file. Okay, so the, the cache of all of these two users are the same. So for whatever demands the users have, so we'll just transmit the remaining part of all the files. So you can see in this case, of course, whatever uh, user one wants, it will be able to decode it. In this case, the load here is equal to one because each file has two parts and two parts are downloaded from the server. So the, so the load is one. So this is only the local caching game. But now we can look at how coded, cache, uh, how coded caching does this. So again, um, each file, let's assume it has two bits. Uh, file A is de decoded into, uh, divided into A1 and A2. 
So in this case, the difference is that when you look at the cache placement, user one is the same, but user two, it stores a different part of the files. Um, let's assume the user demands is A, B. So this basically means the, user, the first user wants file A and the second user wants file B. Let's see uh, w what we can do. So in this case, the server just transmits a summation of two bits, which is A2 plus B1. So you can see the beauty here is that only one bit is transmitted over, uh, over the shared link, uh, which is half of the local caching gain. And let's see how user one can decode its, the file A. You see here, um, user one here, it has B1, right? So it can use B1 to cancel the inference in the transmitted signal. So it will be able to decode A2. Now it will be able to get to the two bits of the file A. So similarly, user two can decode. So in this case, um, we can see T equals one. So T plus one equals two. So the load here is just one half of the local caching gain. So this is the idea of the global caching gain. Then for a different user demands, we can, uh, the server just send one bit, uh, which, which are all a summation of two bits here. So we will not uh, look into detail of this. Okay, uh, there are some, some limitations of coded caching. So basically, um, the sub packetization complexity just means that, so for general T, for coded caching system, so basically, each uh, T subset, which is a subset containing T users, will co correspond to a specific subfile. So as a result of this, so each file has to be split into K choose T subfiles. We know this K choose T is a very large number in terms of the number of users or T. For example, in this figure here, this just plots the number of subfiles per file with respect to the uh, number of users. For example, if, if we have 60 users and we fix t equal to 5, then each file has to be split into 6 million subfiles. And if we have like 100 users, then 75 million subfiles. This is very large number. If you have to index this one, you have to use a lot of bits. The overhead is very large. So it is very important to reduce the sub packetization complexity. So, okay. But for the original code caching problem, it seems that this sub is minimum under some assumptions, it cannot be reduced. But actually for um, other variants, for example, like the device to device coded caching, um, this number can actually be reduced. So that's uh, one, work of our, uh, one of our work. So device, device, code, uh, device to device code caching is like, um, there are different users, there's no central server. So each user will store some, some files, like the popular files. It will act like a transmitter and take turns to transmit to other users. So they will satisfy their demands. So the number of subfiles for device to device coded caching, just, you know, it's kind of, it's the same as the centralized code caching, but also with this extra layer of sub packetization of T, basically means each subfile has to split, has to be split into T smaller files. So for this one, we propose a packet tab based approach. So basically we explore the asymmetry in the placement and the delivery phase. Um, so we first, uh, in this approach, we first group the users, divide the users into groups. For example, here, one, two, three is a group and four, five, six, another group. So each color that cover a different number of users is a packet tab. So with this design, we can actually have two reduction gains. So the first one is called subfile exclusion, which means that some subfiles will not be used in our design caching scheme. For example, in this case, this uh, green color uh, subfile can be excluded. Then the second gain is called, uh, uh, which is due to the smaller split ratio than T here, because here, each subfile is split into T packets. But if we can small it into a smaller number of packets, so the total number of packets will be smaller. So the joint effect of these two just leads to an otherwise reduction on F. But the good thing is that the rate is still optimal. There are some, uh, some uh, other works that reduces F, but compromise the, the, the rate. Um, yeah. 
So this also reveals a fundamental difference in the shared link and device-to-device -device code caching, at least in terms of subpractization. And then we study this, uh, this issue in the cache-aided wireless inference network. So again, in this case, the existing work just applies the coded caching placement on both the transmitter side and the receiver side. You see the, the K choose T terms just kind of multiply together, uh, causing a very large F. So in this case, we actually uh, proposed a hypercube-based uh, approach. So like I mentioned here, so we use a hypercube to represent a file and the lattice points to represent the subfiles. So by carefully designing the cache placement and the delivery phases, we can achieve the optimal degrees of freedom of this network while exponentially uh, reducing the number of packets per file. Okay. So another limitation of coded caching is the lack of privacy. As I mentioned, the user demands are exposed to the service and also to uh, other users. So existing work uh, considers some, uh, some scenarios, for example, in the private information retrieval uh, system, where the one user requesting files from multiple servers. But for this case, no cache is considered. Then there comes the cache aid, single user PIR, where uh, there, the single user is equipped with a cache, but the cached contents are assumed to be known by the servers. So in this case, because there's only one user, there's no global caching game possible. Then uh, another uh, variant is the demand private code caching where, so there's a single server, but multiple user, users. So the, each user is prevented from knowing the demands of other users. As we can see that none of this above work considers uh, multi-user or multi-server privacy. Okay, so in the, uh, given this, we propose a new problem called cache-aided multi-user private information retrieval, where there are multiple users and each server should be prevented from knowing the demands of the users. Our goal is to identify the global caching gain under the privacy constraint. Okay, let's look at the cache-aided MUPR problem. So here is a basic setup. So we have n different servers and we have KU users. And so we assume that these servers do not talk to each other, which means they do not collude. Okay, the system works also like, like in code caching, two phases, the cache placement phase, where the users just uh, fill up their cache and the private delivery phase. So uh, we use this theta to represent the demand of the other users. So the system works like this. When the demands are reviewed, so the users cooperatively generate a query represented by this queue to each server. And the server will just respond with an answer here, like the red line here. So by collecting all these answers, each user should be able to decode their request file. But the, uh, the privacy here means that each server should not be able to learn this demand vector. So if we read this in, in terms of mutual information, which basically means that you know this query and the answer seen by server n here should be independent of the demand vector. So here some of the conditioning on the files and the cache is that we assume that the cached contents is known by the servers. Okay, and then the metric of this system is the download cost or the load, which is basically the entropy, the total entropy of these answers downloaded from the servers uh, again, normalized by the file size. So we aim to find the minimum load given the memory size while uh, achieving the privacy constraint. Let's look at a, a, a very simple example with, again, with two users and two files. So in this case, we assume each file has three bits like here. And then the cache placement is that user one just stores A1 plus B1 and user two stores A2 plus B2. Let, then let's see how we can construct the answers or queries from to this servers. Uh, let's assume F1 be an answer from server one, okay? Because then there we see that there must be exist two different answers of server two such that the combination of F1 and G1 will be able to de decode the demand AB and F1 and G2 will be able to decode another demand BA. So here, uh, we, for ease of presentation, we just uh, um, 
uh, consider the distinct demand case where the demand can only be A, B, or B, A. There's no A, A, or B, B here. So this actually represents the privacy of server one because server one doesn't know which uh, of G1 and G2 is chosen by the, servers, uh, by the second server. So it doesn't know what the demand is. Now, similarly, uh, for if we fix G1, there should exist an F2 that can demand, uh, decode the, the other demand. So now with this, uh, with this fixed structure, we just need to determine what specifically these answers are. So, um, Uh, let's assume this, uh, the F1 just two bits, A3 and B1 plus B2 and plus B3. Okay, with this, with this one, let's see how we can determine G1 here uh, and we, if we consider this demand. So if you look at user one, so it wants A, so it, B1 here is an inference for it. In order to decode A1, so B1 has to be canceled from the answers from the two servers. Okay, so again, in order to recover B1, so here we, put B2 plus B3 here, if you subtract this part and this part, you will be able to decode B1, then you, user 1 will have A1, and then with this A3 and A2 here, it will be able to decode all the three bits. And then if we consider this demand here, we can do a very similar thing, uh, in this case to cancel the inference of A1 to user 1. Okay, Simil uh, similarly, we can just fill up all these um, uh, answers with linear combinations. So the private the delivery phase is very uh, kind of, we just, uh, if the user demand is A, B, we just kind of randomly choose F1 and F2 from server one with equal probabilities. And then if F1 is choosed because the demand is A, B, so we just choose a request G1 from the second server, or if F, two is requested, we just request a corresponding G2. So for the other demand BA, it's very similar, except, except that we do this crossing um, lines here to, to, to choose the combinations. So the privacy here is kind of very uh, intuitive here because uh, each server only sees a random choice of this F1 or F2 uh, or G1 or G2, and each server doesn't know what the choice of the other server is, so it doesn't know the demand vector. Okay, the most challenging part for this problem is the commerce. So basically, um, we can show there's another achievable po point here. So the red line here represents the achievable load of uh, MUPR. The black line here represents the coded caching problem. So when the memory is small, like when it's less than one third, so we see that these two lines actually coincide with each other. So this means privacy has no penalty. And because the code caching has no privacy, so it will be uh, naturally be a lower bound uh, for our MUPR problem. And then we see if the memory is larger than two thirds. So this line here actually coincides with the single user cache aided PR problem. So because we have multiple users, the load cannot be lower than the single user case. So again, this is also a, a commerce for our problem. Now we can see the, the, at the both the large and uh, large and small sides, we have the optimal rate. Now the challenging part is that for this middle segment, we need to a uh, new commerce. We basically we need to prove for this case, we need to prove this inequality here. Okay, for uh, for a more general n, we have to prove this here. Okay, let's see how we can um, prove this three r plus three m uh, no less than five. So again like I have showed in the achievable scheme, in order to um, you know, represent the privacy of these users, basically, um, if we look at this, let's assume F1 and G1 are some answers uh, of the, from the two servers. So these are not uh, uh, specific realizations, these are random variables, okay? So basically, we see F1 and G1 uh, can decode demand AB. Uh, what we mean is that we generate a joint distribution of these two random variables, okay? Now, for the privacy of server one, so 
we just fix the marginal distribution of F1 uh, of this joint distribution, and then we generate a G2 such that these two joint di distributions has the same fixed marginal of, of F1. In this case, because F1 is the same, so you, server one will not be able to distinguish these two joint distributions. So this is exactly reflects the privacy of server one. And then we do the same thing, the privacy of the server two. Now with this structure, we can see how we can uh, uh, prove the three R plus three M uh, no less than five. So basically we need to find three uh, combinations of these answers and the cache to recover five different files. Okay, so let's write the first step. So this is very um, straightforward. So these three joint entropy terms, each will be able to decode, uh, decode the file A from these different branches of this canvas tree. Okay, uh, we can just decode the file A here. Now, if we look at the last two, term, uh, last two terms, if we look at this one, um, this here, if we somehow can put F1 into this combination here, then we'll be able to have F1, G1, and Z2, which is here, we'll be able to decode the, the file B. And then if we somehow can put Z1 here in this term, then we have F1, G2, Z1, which call F1, G2, Z1, which correspond to here, we'll be able to decode another file B. In this case, three file A and two file B, we can decode the five different files. Uh, five files. Okay, let's see. Just go through this very quickly. Um, so, for this step, we just dropped some unnecessary terms using the chain rule of, uh, of joint en uh, of entropies, and then we just again using the chain rule, we just divide this term into two uh, conditional entropies, and then we just combine F1 here with this term, and then combine Z1 here with this term. Now. Um, by the uh, you know by by this uh, if you add two together, then we'll be able to uh, you know put these uh, desired terms together, and then we'll be able. We'll be able to decode the, the two file B here as shown in the screen uh, parts. Therefore, uh, we have proved this uh, inequality. So, uh, for the general converse, um, for the general converse is that let's see how to construct this converse tree. For example, uh, in the case of three servers, let's assume F1, G1, and H1 are answers from the servers, so they can decode the file uh, demand AB. So, for the privacy of server one, there must exist another uh, combination of G2 and H2 such that the other demand can be decoded. Then very similarly, uh, the server two uh, privacy and server three's privacy, uh, three's privacy. Okay, so for general n, basically we want to find two n minus one of these combinations of answers and cache to prove this inequality, but we will not talk about that here. Uh, so for this, we have some general results for this cache aided multi-user private information retrieval, which is that we have a product design that works for any system parameters so that is, this is all the optimal in general and is exactly optimal in the large cache memory uh, regime. And then we have some, uh, spe we study a specific case with two users and two files. So for the general demand case, we show that the proposed scheme is optimal when there are two or three uh, servers. And for the distinct demand case, like I have talked about, the, our scheme is optimal for any number of servers. Okay. Uh, to summarize of the first part, so we studied two different aspects of code caching. First one is a, is a subpackization. We studied two settings, which is D2D. We propose a packet tab based approach with order reduction on F, but preserves the optimal rate. And then we uh, study another scenario where, where it's a wireless interference network, where we propose a hypercube based uh, scheme, again, which preserves the optimal uh, degrees of freedom, but with reduced uh, F. Then we studied the private, uh, cache-aided multi-user private information retrieval problem. So the major novelty here, besides the achievability, is the decoding, commerce decoding tree. Yep. Uh, now let's go to the second part. Distributed power. 
distribute the power control for millimeter wave networks. So uh, the motivation for this one, you know, uh, power allocation problem in wireless interference networks is a long existing uh, problem. But uh, from an information theoretic view, how to treat the interference optimally is an open problem. And even if we just treat the interference as noise, I just don't care about that. The problem is still is non-convex. And the, the existing approaches only kind of find stationary points of the problem. There's no optimality guarantee for that one. So uh, this interference condition can be a more challenging in millimeter wave networks, where as you can see here, the transmission are beam based. If there's no proper coordination of beams, the interference will be very bad there, so which hinders the system throughput. So nowadays, um, we see this success of data-driven approaches like using machine learning, deep learning for these wireless systems. So this basically, uh, what we do is that we study the old problem, but apply new approaches there. So uh, we, we are also interested in distributed approach, uh, approaches, which is scalable and also because of the lower complexity. So, so the basic setup of this problem is that we have K base stations. So each base station is associated with uh, one user. And the system is a synchronized and slotted system. As you can see here, it has multiple epochs. So each epoch contains different slots. So we assume that the channel changes from slot to slot, but stays the same within each slot. OK, uh, the, there's a power constraint for each base station, which is a maximum power constraint. And we also assume that one UE can be scheduled by each base, base station at a time. OK, so the, in order to uh, we formulate this network utility optimization problem here, as shown here. So uh, first of all, this xk here is the average throughput per epoch of user k. Okay, uh, and then we have, besides the maximum power constraint, we also have this average power constraint for each base station. Now we are trying to maximize a utility function here. For example, uh, we can choose ux to be log x. So this is a special case of the, uh, the, of the so-called alpha fairness model. So basically, you can see this is a concave function of the throughput. This basically means that if a user is achieving a very large throughput, if you increase the throughput, your utility will not grow any larger. So, but this increases users with small throughput to, uh, to gain larger throughput because their utility will increase very uh, fast. Okay. So uh, the problem with this one is that we see that objective is a function of the time averages. This is kind of not easy to solve, so we just transform this problem into an equivalent one where we, uh, the objective, you can see in this case, becomes time average of these functions. So in this case, we have to kind of introduce a new auxiliary variable called gamma k for each, um, each base station. So beside this power constraints, so this the relation between this gamma k and the uh, original, uh, the average throughput is here. It has a maximum uh, per constraint. And it also the average value of this gamma auxiliary uh, variable should be uh, less than the average throughput of the users. So now uh, for this problem, we can actually use the Lyapunov drift plus penalty uh, framework to decompose it into two sub-problems, and together with two virtual queues to satisfy this average constraints. So uh, before I dive into these two sub-problems, let's see what's the relationship between this original problem and the sub-problems. So here, uh, we have this inequality. So here, let's assume SK sub is just a, a solution that we have found to the sub-problems at each epoch, and then let's assume this is the optimal solution of the sub-problems. So if we can solve these sub-problems within, uh, within some gap B, then we're able to have this here. So this here is that uh, the, the gap between our approach and the optimal uh, solution for the original problem. 
we can see that the, this gap can actually be reduced by a factor of v. So this v here is called the Lyapunov constant, which can be tuned by manually. But the problem is that there's a trade-off between convergence speed uh, and the optimality gap. So now let's look at the, the sub-problems. Um, so the first sub-problem is here. It's just uh, trying to solve the uh, auxiliary variable in each epoch. So here, the, it, we have a HKT here. This is a ver one of the virtual queue for auxiliary variable. So it is updated according to this equation. So we'll, uh, let's see uh, how this works, okay? So this update, uh, updating rule actually enforces this average constraint here. Um, let's just look at this. Assume at some time t, so this gamma k becomes very large, okay? This becomes very large, then at the next time, this virtual q value will also become very large. Now, if we look at the objective here, because we want to maximize this, there's a minus sign here. If this coefficient is very large, then at time t plus one, so this auxiliary variable will be smaller. So this is kind of a negative feedback. So this enforces overall, in the long run, enforces this average constraint. So this problem, because the constraints are not coupled among different base stations, we can let each base station solve this problem uh, independently. Now the second sub-problem, as shown here, is, uh, is non-convex. Uh, so here, Zika here is a power virtual Q. We'll look at that later. So here, you can see here is that X key here is a, a throughput in epoch T. So this throughput is uh, a function of the signal to noise and the inference ratio. It is non-convex. And uh, then, um, again, if we look at this part, uh, very similar to what I've talked uh, talk in the previous slide. So we, get, we have this neg negative feedback loop to enforce this average power constraint. Now, uh, if you look at this objective here, it actually takes a general form, which is uh, you know, alpha times throughput minus beta times power. So for example, if beta somehow equals zero, then this becomes a maximizing the throughput problem. This is a very nice formulation. We use game theory and Q learning uh, to, uh, to, to, to define a reward or the payoff function in this form. But we will not talk about that here. Um, so to recap here, we have this original utility maximization problem. And we transfer it into an equivalent form then sub-problem one is convex, easy to solve. We have to this non-convex sub-problem. So we propose various approaches to solve it. Now, let's focus on how we can model this uh, using deep reinforcement learning. So uh, reinforcement learning is the basic foundation. It's a mark of decision process where the agent interacts with the environment and receives reward, make actions, receives reward. Okay, a policy is just a, a mapping from the state. Uh, to the action, okay. So our goal is to find the uh, policy that maximize uh, accumulated reward. So before uh, uh, I explain what this means, so let's just look at the definition of Q function. So the Q function uh, of, a, of a state and an action pair is just defined as a total discounted reward in the future if we start from some specific pair, S and A. So gamma is called discount factor, which basically means that the reward in the near future is more important in the far future. Okay, our objective here is just, uh, you know, the average of these Q functions uh, over all states. So here, rho mu is a stationary distribution of the states. So uh, one way in order to maximize this objective, one very straightforward way is to just do the uh, set the derivative uh, to zero. So in this case, we call this uh, policy gradient because our uh, policy here is deterministic. So we call this deterministic policy gradient where we first parameter the policy using some, some theta. For example, if mu theta is a deep neural net, theta will just be the weights and bias. So then we can use the gradient ascent to find the optimal weights of the neural nets. So uh, what really makes the uh, uh, DPG powerful is the use of neural nets, which called deep DPG, where people use deep neural nets to represent the policy, which is called actor, and the Q function, which is called critic. So let's see how does deep DPG works. So 
in this case, so the actor is actually represented by a neural network here, which takes input state and outputs the action here. And then the critic takes x and a as input and outputs the q function. So we have to train this neural network to let it learn the uh, q functions and the policies. So there are two tricks, with it, which is first one is experience replay buffer, where the experience of the users are kind of collected together and put into this buffer. And then many batches of this data are collected from, are sampled from the buffer to train these two net, neural nets. Let's see how we can train the, uh, train the critic first. So this is kind of, uh, what we do here, this is a very standard neural network input and output model here. So what we need to do is just to define the loss function here. So if we sample n sam uh, experiences here, so the loss is, ju is just the average of the mean square error of these two terms, output of the critic and this target term. So this target term actually is called the temporal difference target in reinforcement learning. Uh, but the one tricky thing is that this target is not created by the uh, these two network critic on actor networks. It's actually created by two target networks. So the target networks is just a copy of these two main networks, but are less less frequently updated in order to stabilize the learning process. And then once we have learned the critic, we can again learn the uh, train the actor weights in this case. You see that if we have some state, we input this to the actor, it will produce an action. Then we feed this state and action into the critic, then we'll get this output or the function. So again, if you will this part as an input and this part as output and this part as a parameter to optimize, we can again, with this loss function, we can train these actor networks. Okay, so far what we have talked about is in single agent systems. But when we come to multi-agent systems like the power scheduling problem, so uh, of course we can you know, the, the state transition of the environment is determined by the joint actions of all the agents. We can, of course, can use a centralized MDP to solve this problem, but the problem is that the state and action space will be very, very large and exponential in the number of agents, which is a complexity we just cannot handle. And also because some privacy um, considerations, usually the users are not, uh, the agents are not able to know the actions of other agents. So this will cause a problem called a non-stationarity of each agent. Basic, basically means that the environment transition will not be stationary. It changes with time. So it, this just validates the MDP assumption there. So this, then there comes the idea of multi-agent um, DDPG. So in this case, the key insight for this algorithm is that if we, for, if we look at one agent, and fix the actions of all other agents, the environment seen by that agent will be stationary, right? Because it is uh, uh, fixed, right? So, okay, so in this case, we need to define a new Q function for agent I here. Again, we have this state, but besides the action of agent I, we also condition the Q function on the actions of other agents. So the, So, uh, so in this case, uh, also the global state consists of local observations of different agents. So in order, in order to train this Q function, we have to, each agent has to know the actions and the observations of, of other agents. So therefore, uh, they just, they just uh, use the so-called centralized training and distributed execution framework, where uh, there's a centralized replay buffer so where the users just push their actions and observations into this buffer 
and then they grab the many batches of data uh, of the, in the centralized form to train their queue functions. So the actions are made distributedly, which basically means the action is only based on, based only on the observation of each agent. So distribute, so this challenges in MADDPG is that if you have a still, if you have a large number of agents, you know, the input to the actor and the critic network will be very large, which is kind of hard to let the neural network converge. Uh, so in this case, we just modify uh, the MADDPG a little bit to propose a distributed MADDPG. The key uh, idea here is that we limit the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, we limit the only a subset of the agents to share with each other. For example, we define a queue function here for agent i. It, it's based on its local obser observation, but also observations from its neighbors. So this ni here is just a neighbor set, also the actions from the neighbor set. And the intuition behind this is that uh, when the user, for example, in the power control problem, when two base stations are very far from each other or the beams are not uh, overlapped. So there's little interference from between these two base stations. So this, it is not necessary to include that user in our observation space. We can only consider these base stations that has, uh, that has a strong impact on our state transition. Okay, uh, this figure just shows with four agents. So each agent will just push its local observations and actions to the two neighboring, um, two neighboring buffers. Okay. Now uh, we can look at this, how we can apply this to the throughput maximization problem. Again, here is our goal here. Uh, it's very straightforward. Now we need to uh, model this system. Again, the action, we model the base stations as the agents. The action is just a power. The reward here, we we use a very intuitive reward, which is just uh, some throughput of the network at time t. Of course, this will require some data transformation of this uh, throughput among the networks, but this uh, communication overhead is usually very small. And this, there are some other approaches that design very complicated uh, rewards, but that is very heuristic and there's no uh, general design guidelines for that. So we just use this simple reward here. And then the most important part or novel part is how to design this observa observation. From my uh, experiments, I found this is very important. Um, yeah, so basically for base station I, its observation space at time t consists of two parts. So this first part is just contains some information about base station I itself. And then the second part contains some information from the neighboring base stations as we defined in the distributed MA DDPG. So let's look at this, how the first part, okay. Let's see what does these quantities mean. So the first uh, quantity here is the power in the previous slot. And then here is the direct channel between base station I and its scheduled UE in the previous slot. And then comes the, uh, the direct channel at the current slot. Then this I T minus one here is the total interference measured at the base station I in the previous slot. And then we have another interference term, which is I hat T. So this is the total interference at the beginning of slot T of the current slot. Uh, so the reason we use this, or the reason that these two terms are different is that we assume at the beginning of each slot, the channel just changes, but the power has not been determined. So therefore, if you look at this, the channels has changed, but the power is still the old power. So each base station can also measure a new inference term. And then for the last two terms, this is uh, throughput of base station I in the previous slot. And uh, this, is, uh, the, this term is uh, very important. So this basically is a throughput of base station I over the sum throughput of its neighbor sets. So this quantity actually tells the uh, uh, agent how, or what is the contribution that you contribute to your kind of this small community. Okay, then we go to the second part of this one. This contains some, uh, uh, some inference measurements from neighboring base stations. So here, uh, the first term here is just uh, inference from neighbor G here. So here we define uh, the neighbor set Ni uh, for base station I here. 
And then the second term is just the inference from neighbor G, but at the beginning of the current slot. So then, again, we have this uh, throughput uh, from the neighbor G here. Uh, now, uh, let's look at the experiments we have. So we implement this algorithm using PyTorch. And uh, for the actor and critic, critic networks, um, we use the three hidden layers um, with uh, 200, 150, uh, and 50 neurons in each layer. Um, so the neighbor set is that we choose the six uh, neighbors that is closest to each base station as a neighbor set. So uh, there are some parameters that we used for this implementation. So I will not uh, talk about this. So we also have two baseline schemes, which is the weighted, weighted minimum mean square error approach and the fractional programming approach. So these two approaches are the state-of-the-art approaches. So these are not learning-based uh, algorithms, just kind of optimization traditional algorithms, but they are centralized algorithms, which means that they require all the channels in the network. Uh, so what we do is that uh, we have multiple slots and the channels are changing from slot to slot. What we do is that in each slot we run 2,000 iterations to let this algorithm converge to find the power allocation and then we use that for that slot. Okay. Then we compare our scheme with these two baselines. So, uh, so first let's consider a, a network with four base stations uh, like these uh, green squares. So each base station is associated with three different UEs, like these red dots here. Um, so UEGI is a G's UE of BSI. So again, we have different uh, configurations to show different interference scenarios. If you look at this picture here, when the center, the users in the centers are scheduled, you see these beams just overlap. This is a very bad interference. Uh, uh, inference scenario, which is a ma major challenge in millimeter wave networks if we consider distributed approaches. Then we consider a kind of a mild case where uh, the beams are weaker and uh, are not overlapped with each other. Uh, and also for a testing case, um, we test the omnidirectional case because uh, we can just set the parameter and let the beam to uh, span over a circle. It will be omnidirectional. So uh, we just, uh, in this plot, we just plot the average throughput per base station. Okay, so this is a moving average with a window size of 100. So basically at each time slot, we average the throughput with the previous 100 slots. So uh, we, we can see, uh, get some observations from these slots here. So here, um, this purple curve is our approach, uh, proposed approach, and then at the top, this blue curve is a uh, fractional programming, and this yellow curve is a WMSE. So each of these curve is an uh, average of uh, three, over three different channel realizations. Okay, we can see we also have this full reuse, which basically all base stations transmit with maximum power, and the random, so they, they, these are uh, very close to each other. We see that actually our scheme kind of starts from the random case, and then gradually increase and finally um, achieves a throughput that is slightly better than these two baselines. So uh, this, uh, this phenomena here gradually goes, goes up is because um, in our implementation, uh, we have used some explore action noise in order to let the agent explore what is a good uh, combination of the powers. So uh, this noise is decreasing uh, with time. Okay, so as time goes, this noise becomes smaller and smaller, and then the algorithm just focuses on this, uh, the, the good solution it has found during this exploration process. And then, again, we have this for the, for the, uh, for the second configuration and the omnidirectional configurations. Again, we see that this, uh, our scheme can outperform these baselines, but the, it seems that the WMSE is not very uh, kind of stable because here you can see that in both cases FP is better than WMC. I guess one of the problems is here is that this algorithm depends on the initial points, how they initialize their algorithm. The result will be very different. And then we just consider a larger network with eight different base stations. So each base station will have its neighbors as a neighbor set. Again, uh, we show this, this is the throughput in the training phase. 
And then in order to, uh, then we also test this, our algorithm on, on another set of channel realizations. This is called the testing phase. So in this case, we just shut down the learning process and they use the learning, learned policy to let it run over 2,000 uh, random slots and then uh, plot the empirical, uh, you know, the cumulative density function of these different algorithms here. We can see in the red most is uh, FP. It actually achieves the uh, best uh, average uh, throughput. And, but our scheme is very close to WMSE in this case. And again, these two random and maximum power cases are uh, kind of not good. So to summarize, in this part, we studied the distributed power control for millimeter wave networks. So first, we proposed a Lyapunov optimization framework to optimize the network utility. Then we have two sub problems and the virtual queues. And then we proposed various approaches to solve the second non-convex sub problem. Then we um, focus on the, this deep reinforcement learning based approach and proposed a kind of a distributed version of multi-agent deep deterministic policy gradient where only subsets of base stations are sharing with each other, which reduces complexity and the computation complexity. And then our observation scheme, uh, space design is very novel. And then our scheme can actually beat state-of-the-art um, centralized schemes, uh, which is the WMSE and FP. Okay, here is uh, a, a list of the public, uh, publications I have from this PhD. And then we have this conference papers. Yep, okay, that's the presentation today. Thank you. Okay, so we may uh, first um, let's answer questions from the audience. So any questions? Yeah, I have a question. So on page 10, uh, you mentioned the... You just go. Yeah, I just have a question about the user demand. Yeah. So they are private information, but why is it private? What kind of uh, which do you mean? Uh, this the one? user demand. Uh, uh, here, right? I mean the uh, after lack of privacy. Okay. Yeah. This one. Yeah. I mean, what kind of risk can you know can happen if this demand? know if the servers and other users know this. Uh, yeah, this, this is a privacy, right? Like you um, on social media or something, you request something you don't want others to know, right? This can be very important. Oh, so they can actually know like what I, I look? Uh, or just the data? Uh, let's just think about the file retrieval system or something. Um, you and I are, are kind of download movies from some website, right? Um, so Apparently, I don't want you to know what I have downloaded, or either you don't want me to know that, right? So uh, basically, you said different platforms, they can um, protect privacy. But here, we just use these information theoretic approaches to uh, rigorously, in a mathematical sense, to achieve this privacy. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. In the, I think it was the DNN training part where you, you're considering um, for a base station at the closest six other base stations are the neighbors. Just want to know, like, is there a reason behind that? This one? No, no, no. The, I think the, the one with the table showing your parameters. Yeah. yeah. So the neighbor said it's the sixth closest. So uh, uh, we, we can actually look at this here. So this is a hexagon network in practical systems. So if you look at one specific base station, it will have six different cells that is surrounded it. So uh, in this case, actually, we just uh, uh, select these uh, neighbors according to the distance. 
they, this is a very intuitive approach, but of course, uh, there could be cases like uh, if the beam of a uh, base station, let's see this base station three and base station four, they are very far from each other, but the beam of base station four directly points towards the user of base station three. In this case, even though they are far apart from each other, there could be some interference. Uh, so again, that's one of our uh, future work to identify uh, really the set of neighbors that has strong impacts, which may not be exactly the same, the set of neighbors that is closest in distance. Yeah. So it's basically just because the base stations are distributed in this way. Yeah, They're yeah. That's because of specific, they are arranged in this way in practical. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no question from the audience, maybe the committee can, can ask questions.